Hello and welcome to Frank's School. Fifth year, 50th day, first video, probably only video today. What's going on? Uh, periodically over the last four and a half years, I have stopped and done a video to try to explain what's going on with Frank's School. Well, I, I decided suddenly it's, it's time I, sh I should do that again. Uh, this is the fifth year, and the fifth year of Frank's School is different. It, it's not as academic in a way. Uh, I don't, I don't want to go back through uh, all the other years uh, at the moment. Uh, eventually, I'll, I've got a lot of sorting out I, I still need to do. But it's different because this year I'm devoting it pretty much to the building of the campus itself the, in, in, in real space. Uh, and so, so much of it is about the things I'm building out there. Uh, uh, and actually, <clears throat> I'm going through a, a series that I'm going to call the State of the School. Uh, before they had been um, prospecting what I planned to do, but then I decided, no, I'm doing it. <laughs> so I'll just show you, here's what I'm doing, the state of the school. And it, Shirley's Keller is the next one. We're, I'm about to take my viewers inside the basement of the, uh, the newer of the two big barns, a, place, a space I call Shirley's Keller in honor of my German friend. Keller is like a it's like a cellar. <laughs> a little hard to explain. But anyway, I've paused because, for one thing, I'm waiting for my goats, that one goat in particular, to have kids. I've got three goats that are going to have babies. And one of them is so ready. Her name is Heidi. And I thought it would be nice if I could film that. And that's going to happen in Shirley's Keller. Uh, but also, the ground is now frozen. We've had some bitter cold weather with strong winds, and uh, and now uh, I am working inside uh, more. Uh, and and that was the plan, trying to keep Shirley's Keller reasonably warm for the goat kids, for one thing. All right, now <clears throat> I don't like to do this. That's why the sorry, but uh, I need to be a little bit auto autobiographical, I think, to explain some things. So uh, here's a little bit about <clears throat> my past. I'm going to go back to the 1970s, which may seem like ancient history to some of you. Uh, well, it, well, why that's happened is because of a couple of books, in a way. Uh, I just, there are some things that I probably should explain. E even if I've explained them elsewhere in Frank School, I should explain them again. In the 1970s, when I came here uh, to this farm, I was alone. I had a dog. That was it. Uh, me and my dog. Uh, we were alone on this whole farm. That was 1974. April Fool's Day, 1974, was the day that I uh, arrived here. And in the 70s, at that point, I, when I arrived here, I did not think I would ever be a teacher because I had not finished the preparation to be a teacher. I knew a lot. And I could teach, but you know, you had to sort of have that stamp on your ass, certified teacher. Uh, and I didn't see my getting that. Uh, and so I made a, uh, was ma was planning my life without that. Uh, as a matter of fact, at that time, OBB, Old Bedford Village, I was the crafts program director when it opened, Old Bedford Village, because that did fit very well with the knowledge that I have. But <clears throat> I got married. <clears throat> My wife made it possible for me to finish the uh, preparation so that I could be certified to teach. And eventually I went on to be a teacher. Now while I was still substituting, and I substitute taught for almost 10 years, uh, and I loved it. Uh, very little money, but I, I, lo I loved it. Uh, and, uh, and during that time, uh, I mean at that point I realized I loved teaching. It's just that uh, I was not going to be able to jump through those hoops, uh, maybe better that way, to become a certified teacher. Anyway, at that time, one semester I taught metal shop. I remember I was substituting, I was in, dressed about like this, and I went into these guys in suits and ties. And they asked me if I could do that, and I said, well, yeah, I, I, I could do that. I could uh, teach metal shop. So for one semester I taught metal shop. After that, I then uh, eventually got a full-time job. At first it was a literature teacher, seventh grade. You may hear a cat fight here. Uh, uh, a literature teacher, seventh grade, and then eventually it became humanities. <clears throat> and then that was what I, what I taught in the first year 
was what I taught for oh, 25 years, perhaps more or less. So that was academic, <clears throat> and I left the the trades, in a sense, the metalwork, the shop behind. Uh, but I did have clubs. <laughs> I had a low-tech club, for example. Uh, I had a botany club. I had an outing club where I took children up and we hiked the mountain and I had an architecture club. In other words, this stuff was still spilling out of me <clears throat> that was not simply uh, related to uh, my English major. At Harvard, I was an English major. Uh, and so the, the, on paper, it seemed like English was what I should teach, and that, that was what I was certified then to teach. Uh, but, so I'm being autobiographical, and, and why am I doing this? this? Well, uh, there was kind of a reuniting, I don't know if I've spelled that right, a book reuniting that has happened with me over the last uh, uh, month or so. Uh, I, uh, Dover Publishing Company, was a company that, that has served me well, uh, very well. And I learned about it, I think probably out of the uh, Whole Earth Catalog. Some of you might remember that. Back when I was in Brazil in the Peace Corps, I got a copy of the whole, uh, whole Earth Catalog and then bought certain books. <clears throat> and here's the principal one, I suppose, that I had said to Shirley and others that this is just blowing my mind. Uh, this The kinematic, oh, no, not this one, I'm sorry. That one I just got, this one. A Short History of Technology. <clears throat> I had read that very carefully back in, in the 70s, and now I'm reading it very carefully again. What a different view of the past when you look at it in terms of technology. And it had influenced me more than I think I had realized. And now I'm being reunited. Now part of that <clears throat> was this kinematics of machinery. I had got it too. Now now it if you <laughs> let's see if I could show you some of some of this. It, it's online actually. If you if you wanted to badly enough you could find you could find this uh, and read it online. Uh, well, that has a lot to do with <clears throat> what I'm doing with machinery. But this is the principal one that is, uh, at the moment, reuniting me, uh, reawakening what was there before I got so academic. Uh, last year, I, I uh, devoted part of the fourth year to the trades, quite a bit of the fourth year to the trades. And uh, that was influenced by heavily by a book like this, which I had had earlier and, and uh, I mean again you, you could find this if you if you wanted to uh, there are a, a list of all these colonial trades and beautiful illustrations uh, I, I, I showed this to you before I mean that I was aware of but I had forgotten about the history of technology the influence of this book uh, all right so the one other thing and may, it's probably the reason I'm doing this at this moment is because I had a dream last night that was shockingly real. Uh, I'm going to start telling the story in Frank's school of a movie. I guess you'd call it a screenplay in a way, but I'm not going to write a screenplay. Uh, I have in my mind a movie. I, I'm, I'm giving it at the moment the name Resurrection. And I've, I've thought about it ever since about last year. June or May, when I was in Lisbon with the Hawkins, uh, and I, I should not probably put it off any further. I should start to explain about this movie. I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do with the idea back at that time, and gradually I realized, well, I'll, I'll tell the story of the movie in my course, which uh, I will do to the extent that I can. Uh, the dream what shocked me into doing this is uh, I had this recurring dream. I must have had it 20 times or more of being lost in a city, usually at night and usually in a foreign land. Uh, I have often enough been lost in a city in a foreign land, even at night in Paris. But this one, uh, so that's happened to me often. This one was different though. It was, I was lost for a while in a city, but it was in the daytime, and I, I think it was in Brazil, uh, and I was at that city because I was talking to a movie producer who was interested, very interested, in producing this movie. So interested 
that I wasn't having to really do the work. Uh, he was picking my brain. I think he was from Denmark or maybe from Norway, even though it was in Brazil. I mean, it, it was it, dreams are so strange anyway. And uh, uh, I think at one point he said, well, he'd seen a movie a little bit like that. I think it might have been called Traurigkeit, which means sadness. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. No, I don't think that was the name. But anyway, I had left the meeting and gone off to see if I could see that movie because somebody came back and said, oh, yeah, that was a really great movie. And in the process, I got lost. But in the daytime, what was so different is as I was trying to find my way back, there were a few people waiting for me. They found me. <laughs> that was so nice. First, a, a man who was sweeping the streets found me. And and then there was a, a couple of uh, young women, I think, that, that they found me and guided me back to where I was supposed to go. A strange dream, and I'm really sorry to be so autobiographical and personal with this, but it jolted me. Uh, it jolted me into thinking, I'd better start. I'd better not let it go any further. So uh, that's, gonna be go that's going to be happening quite soon. Now, now you know what's going on. Bye for now.